We're going to continue in our series. Uh, I, I've been loving this. We've been in a series called 30,000 Feet. All right, now the reason why we call our series 30,000 Feet is because we are looking at the Bible from the big picture. All right, if commercial planes, they often fly at 30,000 feet. But when you look out the window of a plane, the world looks different than if you're just standing on the ground looking at it. It looks really different. You don't see all the details. You don't see everything that's down there at 30,000 feet. Instead, you see full cities. You see full areas. You see the roads that connect them together. And these are important. It's a new way of looking at it. And we have taken the last, uh, to, this is the ninth week we've been in this series, to go through the entire story of the Bible from a 30,000 foot view. How do these stories connect to each other? How do these books connect to each other? How did God do this with multiple authors, all these different things? How is this one story? So today, I want us just to kind of be uh, ready just for God to maybe illuminate something in a new way. We haven't seen it in that way before, that God could speak to us and challenge us uh, in a way that he maybe hasn't before, or maybe we've just been too uh, thick-headed to even realize it sometimes. Uh, we just want God to speak to us. Would you just pray with me this morning uh, as we get started that God would speak to us? Lord, we, uh, we come here this morning, and, and we don't want it to be routine. We don't want it to be tradition. We don't want to just be filling a seat uh, filling a Sunday morning. God, we are here because we want to be changed, because we believe that there's more for us in life. We believe that you have something for us. And God, we pray this morning, Lord, that we would just have the ears to hear you. Lord, that we'd be sensitive to your voice and that you would just challenge us. God, we ask that in your name. Amen. Now, over the last nine weeks, I, I feel like we've learned a lot about our relationship with God uh, through this series. And one of the things that we've realized by doing this is from the beginning, God wanted to have a relationship with everyone. We talked about this. God created us actually to be in partnership with him, to reign over his creation alongside of him. And we decided to try it our own way instead uh, of his way. And because of this, we caused a, we caused a divide between us and him. And ever since then, God has been trying to mend that relationship and get back to the way that he intended it. He has been pursuing us. Now, initially, he did this by, by pursuing one man. And his name was Abraham. Uh, and then he wanted to use his family. And he wanted to start with him. And through him, God wanted to reconnect with all of creation. I want us to read this this morning. Genesis 12, uh, just one through three. It says, the Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who, who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. God's plan from the beginning was everybody. Sometimes we miss that when we read through the Old Testament. And you're like, man, God really only cares about this group of people and he has no regard for anybody else. That's not it at all. But he had a plan of how he could reach everybody. God wanted to bless everyone on earth. He wanted to restore that relationship with them. But so far, our entire story up until this point has been about this one family. Abraham's family, the Israelites. Granted, that family is now huge. Uh, it's an entire nation with many tribes. And we have watched as that family has gone through victories and through hardships. Uh, they have been in love with God and followed him. And they have done absolutely terrible, terrible things. And they've wanted nothing to do with God. The story of the Israelites is a roller coaster. Nonstop, just up and down. Their relationship with God. In this time, God sees that a small course correction is just not working. He tried several times. Can we steer them back towards me? Can we do this? Can we do that? It was not working. So, during the reign of a king named David, God promises David that one of his descendants will be a king that rules forever. We see this promise. We talked about this weeks ago, and this promise kept coming up week after week. They are still waiting. They are still waiting for this person that will rescue them. Someone that will be the greatest king. He'll rescue all the Israelites, lead them back to God, and change everything. But despite this promise, or maybe even at times because of this promise, 
the Israelites kept running from God. They kept living in rebellion. Maybe they were sitting there thinking, like, it doesn't matter. God's sending someone to save us. We might as well just keep living our life now. Why change? There's a plan to kind of fix this, all right? And they're just kind of like, hey, let's just keep living our best life. You know, you do you, YOLO, all, the, all those ridiculous things that are really just statements to say, hey, I'm going to live my life with no regard to anybody else or to God, and I want to do what I want to do. And that is how they've continued to live is on their own terms. Now, at the pinnacle of their disobedience, God removes the Israelites from this area of land that he had given to them, and he sends them away to be servants and slaves of other nations. The purpose of this was to purify them, to try and remove the evil that had built up inside of them. He wanted to hit the reset button for this family, this nation, yet again. And two weeks ago, we saw that the Israelites come back to Jerusalem. They begin to rebuild, but not everyone does. Some stay in these distant lands. Uh, many of them would continue to live there, and they're still part of the Jewish family, part of the Jewish faith, but they're living all over the place at this point. So you have this big family, this big nation spread out across this entire region of the world. Last week, we saw how God decided to take this pursuit of us to a new level. He's going to fulfill the promise of a new king that will rescue. And the king is the way that he always intended it to be. God wanted to be that king. If you remember back, they said, hey, give us a king. We want to be like the other nations. I was like, no, I want to be your king. No, we want to be like them. Give us a king that we can see. came to earth, he stepped into a physical body and, and moved the relationship with us further ahead, closer to what it was supposed to be. Now you would think that if God had come to earth, that people would realize that and they would be excited. Especially since he actually even told them in advance, hey, I'm coming, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change this, everything's going to be good. So Jesus comes, he begins to wage war, not against Rome though, like they wanted, but instead against the stain of sin and rebellion that's on the earth. And he is fighting against sickness and disease. He's fighting against selfishness. He's fighting against injustice. He's fighting against death. But the Israelites, Abraham's family, had started to get an idea in their head of what they thought this king should do. And Jesus didn't look anything like this. He didn't fit that idea. So they started thinking about themselves and what they wanted God to do. So when God came and started doing what he wanted, they rejected him. They fought against him and they killed him. And it looked like he lost this battle against death. Three days later, he proves victorious. And this is amazing. And we see it through this lens. And we're in awe of what he did. But they missed it completely. If you guys weren't here last week, last week everything came together for us. We had been spending weeks and weeks, all these stories, all these things in scripture. And Jesus just brought it all together. And they missed it. Now, after Jesus' death and resurrection, he appears to his disciples and he tells them that he has to leave. All right, I want us to put ourselves in their shoes at this moment. This had to be terrifying when Jesus says, I'm leaving. They're like, no, you're supposed to be with us forever. They thought prior to, you know, prior to Jesus, there was 400 years of silence. God was basically not, I don't want to say absent because we know better. God is not absent. But God was not working and moving in the way that he had there was 400 years of silence prior to Jesus. And I, I have to think that in this moment, they were scared that, are we going to be all alone again? Was God's presence gone? But Jesus tells them, you don't get it. I have to leave so that something, something better can happen. I'm going to send someone else, and you're going to do greater things than I did because of it. Jesus is taken up in front of them. He's seated at the right hand of God, rules over the world from his throne forever. And this is the end of the Gospels and the beginning of Acts. Today we're stepping into the book of Acts and essentially, in some ways, the ending of the story. Now we'll see next week that not quite, but the ending of the story that leads up to us. In Acts, they're waiting. Jesus told them to wait. They're in Jerusalem. This is during the festival of Pentecost. Now, this is important for us to understand. The festival marked 50 days after Passover, and it was a harvest festival. It was the end of the barley harvest, beginning of the wheat harvest. Doesn't always mean a whole lot to us. It meant a lot to them. And it was one of three festivals that the Jewish people had uh, where you would actually have a pilgrimage. You would leave your home, and you would go back to Jerusalem for this festival. 
All right, we saw this kind of at the birth of Jesus. There was a census, but these moments where everybody would go back to where they lived. We kind of do that still, like holidays. Oh, I'm going to go home, see the family type of thing. So this was one of those three where people are they're traveling back to Jerusalem to give gifts and offerings to God. So you had Jewish people from all over the world traveling back. And the disciples are in this house, all right, and, and they're waiting just like God had told them to. And in this moment, we see a rush of wind fills the room and tongues of fire seem to settle on each person as well. Like just this crazy moment of they are in this house, they are praying together, and they're just kind of waiting. And at this point, it had been about a week since Jesus had left. And it's got to be going through their head. How long are we supposed to wait? Did we miss it? Is it going to happen? Did he lie to us? What what is going on? What's what's going to happen here? Now, when we look at the big picture of this, we've talked an awful lot in this series about the symbolism of the wind and fire. We trace this all the way through the Old Testament. Both have been used to represent the presence or glory of God. Remember a few weeks back, God's spirit came into a, a valley of dry bones in Ezekiel and turned them into this great army. You know, that line that we were just singing about. This, this, this wind comes that represents God's spirit. Fire has been used uh, quite a few times as well. When he enters the tabernacle, when his presence, his glory comes into the tabernacle, when his presence and glory goes into the temple, we see fire. When he leads them in the desert, it was a pillar of fire by night. It was a cloud by day, like fire. This represents God's presence. So the purpose of why the Holy Spirit comes At this time, in this way, is to show that God's presence is now entering their bodies in the same way that he entered and dwelled in the temple. We miss this when we read it. Like, we don't miss it. We we understand that. We're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I get that. We miss the significance of what this meant in that moment. We take it for granted. We're just like, oh, yeah, that happened. I remember that. Pentecost, a bunch of crazy stuff in a room. What this imagery is saying is the followers of Jesus are now mini temples. Each one of them is like the temple. The same way that God's presence rested on and in Jesus with the dove at his baptism is now on them. This is why Jesus could say, you will do greater things than I. The idea of being a mini temple is significant. The temple is where you went to encounter God, to be in his presence. And now you could encounter God just by coming in contact with one of Jesus' followers. To be in the presence of a follower of Jesus should have the same type of effect as being in the presence of God. They are, after all, walking, talking, mini temples. That's what this scripture is meant to communicate to us. And when the Spirit rests on them, they begin to speak in other languages. And it just so happens that the city is filled with people who speak other languages because of the festival of Pentecost. You have all these Jewish people coming back from all over at this point. They've learned new languages. They speak different languages. And all of a sudden, God begins to speak to every single one of these groups of Jewish people in their language in that moment. God's timing is so perfect. Those who, they're filled, they begin to speak in these languages and they were proclaiming the amazing things that God has done. They were talking about Jesus. They were talking about what had happened, the difference that was made. And Jewish people from all over the world were hearing this message unfiltered, no translator needed. God's good news, the news about Jesus was moving forward. Peter preaches this crazy sermon, basically, and 3,000 people believe in Jesus in this moment. This starts a revolution in the city of Jerusalem. People stuck around and began talking about it, learning, teaching, and the community is growing. You can just sense the excitement as you just look at the story from this 30,000 foot view. Like, these amazing things are happening. The community is coming together. They are growing. They are they're curious. They're learning. They're, they're doing this with each other. But this troubles the locus, local uh, religious leaders. There's conflict between them. Essentially, what there is, is you have a conflict between two temples. The old temple and the followers of Jesus who are representing this new temple. And in Acts chapter 4 and 5, you see the believers. They're gathering together and they're bringing everything. Have, uh, have you read this scripture before? They're bringing things together to provide for those that are in need. 
All right, and again, we just kind of see this as like, okay, yeah, they lived as a commune. I don't want to do that, but good for them. What's happening here is this was something that the temple was supposed to do. You read this in Deuteronomy. This was a command that the temple should be gathering these things. The temple should be taking care of people. The temple should be taking care of the widows and the orphans and the needs that were around them. But the temple and the priests weren't doing that. And now we have these new temples that come on the scene and immediately they begin to just fulfill what God initially intended for his people to do. People are encountering God's generosity and healing power, not at the old temple, but with the new believers. This, among other things, caused these rifts between the religious leaders and the Christians, and it results with a man named Stephen standing up for what he believes in and getting killed. And in this moment, a wave of persecution hits the Jewish believers, the followers of Jesus, and it sends them running in all different directions. Now, it was still just Abraham's family. Remember, this was the big promise. This whole story was supposed to be all of creation. And it still, at this point, is just Abraham's family. And God wanted to bless all nations, and this right here is the beginning of that. The followers of Jesus are going out into the world, and they are declaring that there is a new king, the risen king, this line of David, King Jesus. See, when a new king came into power in this time, what you would do right away when the new king comes into power is you would send out riders, you'd send out heralds into every direction, and they'd ride into these towns and they'd say, there's a new king, there's a new king, there's a new king, there's a new king. All right, we, we don't have people hop on horses and run around and be like, hey, a new president got elected. Y yeah. Figured that one out like three weeks ago when the election happened and it came in on my phone ten seconds later. Like we, we don't understand these types of proclamations that happen. But to them, this was huge. There's a new king. we got to tell people. And it's the imagery that we see here of God's people going out into the land saying there is a new king. There's a new king. And wherever they go, they clash with the world. And there's almost always problems. Many Jewish people begin to believe in Jesus, but many didn't. And those that didn't, they had issues with the followers of Jesus. But the Christians also clashed with many other religions. They'd go into towns and they had all these different gods. And, and religion was more than just religion. It was, it was your entire community. It was your economy. Businesses were built around creating these little mini statues and gods and, and buying meat to sacrifice to them. And you come in there and start saying, hey, you don't need to do that. There's this guy, and you can just have a relationship. You can just talk to him. All those businesses are gone. They're hitting clashes with the world around them. They clash with society in general. because Not because they were jerks, but because the way that, that, that Jesus taught his followers to live was so countercultural. And it caused issues everywhere they went. Not to mention, you have people going around saying, hey, there's a new king. All right, and they're using the exact same words on purpose as the words that would be used to declare that Caesar is king. You can see an issue. You can see that this is just trouble brewing in the midst of all of this. In this time, God speaks to Peter, tells him that he wants the Gentiles, not that's, that's anybody who's not Jewish, not just the Jewish people to be part of God's family. Peter goes through this process. The Holy Spirit fills the Gentiles just like the believers, right in front of Peter's eyes. And it's this amazing moment where we start to see God's promise finally move beyond this one family that continually has gotten it wrong and say, all right, now's the time. Let's move this forward. I want my relationship with everybody. Saul, a prominent Jewish leader, encounters Jesus and is radically changed. Jesus wants him to bring the message not just to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. And we see this promise. 2,000 years later, God is bringing other nations, other people, into relationship with him. It's been 2,000 years in the making. You see these Christian communities popping up all over. And they're becoming more and more multi-ethnic, diverse, international communities everywhere that they go. And these communities have their own issues as well. That's the, 
That's why we have all of the letters in the New Testament. They had issues uh, with their cities, with the society. They had issues with their leaders. They had issues with each other inside the church. So after Acts, you have all these letters, and that is them trying to say, okay, this thing is spreading fast. It is going to new people. There are new cultures, new towns, things we don't even know about. All of a sudden, they hear about this city way up north in Antioch. They're like, what? There's like a huge church up there. It's essentially like the first booming metropolis of a Christian community, first place that people were called Christians up in Antioch. Paul and Barnabas go up there, and they're like, wow, this is amazing. And they start to launch out from there as missionaries. But you have all these problems that are happening. God wants to bring everybody in on his plan, though. And his plan is moving forward. And that's, that's what we still are doing here today. That same mission is still where we are and who we are. If you ever wonder why we bring missionaries in, you know, every single month, and why we have them talk about this, it's because this matters. This matters. This is still the plan. The plan that was for them is the plan that is for us. Now, technically, there is more to the story. All right? There's more that is written that just hasn't happened yet. And next week, we are going to wrap up this whole big series with one week of like, this is what this all means. What, what is the ending of this actual thing? But I always want us, as, as we go through this scripture quickly, I want us to be able to walk out of here today and say, this is how it applies to my life this week. Because if we come to church, we gather together, we talk about God's word, and we walk out of here and we live our life the exact same way, nothing has happened. We saw a few people, we smiled, we said hi, we saw friends, that's great. You can go to Coburn's at 1230, and I think in Sock Center it's Walmart. <laughs> All right, and you'll see all the same people there. It's crazy. I'm going to start a second service in Coburn's Delhi area. We want to be changed. We want something to happen in our life. Here, here's, here's a few things that I pulled out of this that I want us just to kind of think about this morning. All right, the first one is this. God's timing isn't always what you want, but it's what you need. All right, and I think most of us, if you've been following Jesus for any amount of time, you know this to be true. At least you know the first half to be true. Yeah, God's timing is not what I want. <laughs> Still waiting on the what I need. You know, but it, here's the thing. I'm sure the disciples wished that in that moment that the Holy Spirit would have just came as they're all standing there on this hill watching Jesus ascend and they're standing there and they're like, right now, God, can you just send it? Like Jesus said he was going to send it. Is it just going to be like, basically like he just throws a ball back down to us. Like, okay, see you guys. Last little, uh, there you go. Nothing. And they wait for this roughly a week. And I'll bet that that week didn't feel like a week. I'll bet that week felt like at least a year. Kind of like this last year, how you're just like, it feels like it was like that. It also feels like it's been a decade. In that moment, they're probably just sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. But while they were waiting, they took care of the business that they could. They replaced Judas as a disciple. They bring in another guy, Matthias. And then they waited, and they waited, and they were patient. This is in contrast to the start of the story. Abraham and Sarah, they were waiting on a promise too. But they took matters into their own hands and created a massive mess. And because of that mess, there was a huge injustice done to a young woman and her son. This is meant to contrast the beginning of the story to where we are here. You're meant to see, look at, waiting on God's timing is what you should do. When we look at what was going on when the Spirit came, the timing was so perfect. Jesus had told them to bring the message to the ends of the earth, and a week later, God brings the ends of the earth to them. Right? Like, do we realize that? Like, Jesus is like, hey, this needs to go everywhere. And if they would have said, all right, let's do it right now. Everyone take off. You take that direction. Okay, who's going north? Who's going south? Who's going west? They would have missed it because a week later, everybody from the ends of the earth came to them for the festival of Pentecost. God's timing is, and it's easy to say, well, yeah, they waited like a week. God's timing is so perfect in these 
I don't, I don't know what it is that you're waiting on in life. I think many of us in this room probably have something, something you've been praying for, something you want to see, someone that you want to, you want to see them have a relationship with God, and you've been praying, and you've been praying, and you don't know why it's waiting. Someone that you think should have healing in their body, and you've been praying, and you've been praying, and you've been praying. And you don't understand God's timing. Maybe even they, they pass away, and you're like, well, God, how is your timing perfect? It didn't even happen. We don't understand God's timing. But his timing is what you need because his timing is perfect. His timing brings the big picture into it. It brings the things that you couldn't possibly know or see into the equation. Trust him. Trust him while you wait. Second takeaway this morning. When people spend time with you, do they feel like they've encountered God? It's kind of a weird way of phrasing the question, uh, but I did that on purpose. All right, I'm not trying to make each one of us seem like a God in here, okay? But we talked about this idea. We, the disciples, they turned into these mini temples in that moment when God's presence came down with fire and filled them the same way he filled the tabernacle, the same way he filled the temple. And that was meant to show, you are like my temple. Okay, well, when someone interacts with you, do they walk away feeling like, I just spent time in God's presence. I just spent time in the temple. I just spent time in the Holy of Holies. They would go to the temple to be around God's presence. They would go to the temple for healing. They would go there for forgiveness. They would go there for encouragement in life. God's presence resides in his people. So if we are a temple, if God's presence resides in us, do people feel that when they spend time with you? When you spend time around other believers, do they walk, a, walk away feeling like they just spent time in God's presence? Or do they walk away discouraged? Do they feel like they've been refreshed and encouraged? Are the, is there healing from things in their life, physical or otherwise? Do they feel like there's forgiveness that's extended to them? What about when you spend time with someone who doesn't have a relationship with Christ? Do they feel like something was different? Like, I, I, don't, I don't know why, but when I spent time with that person, something was just different. There was something different about that. And I don't know what it is, but I want to find out what it is. Do people have an encounter with the living God in the Isle of Coburn's? When you walk through there, and you have God's eyes on. And you're walking, you're saying, God, just lead me. Lead me. As they scroll through your Facebook page, do they walk away saying, man, I just feel, I feel God. Or do they walk away being like, I'm not too sure. Do they feel encouraged and hopeful, forgiven, freed? Paul talked about this idea of don't you know your body is a temple? I've always heard this in reference basically to um, hey, you're, you're smoking a cigarette. Don't you know your body is a temple? Hey, you've eaten McDonald's like three or four times this week. Don't you know your body is a temple? Like It's this like precious take care of it. I'm not, I'm not disregarding some of those things, but we have boiled that idea down to something that it was never meant to be, and it's way too simplistic, and it misses out on the power that is inside of each one of us. Don't you know that your body is a temple? Don't you know that people are supposed to encounter God when they come near you? Don't you know that you're a temple? Last one this morning. How are you part of moving God's plan forward? This plan that he has to reach and bless every nation, every person on this planet, this plan is still in today. It hasn't changed. It's your plan and it's my plan. It's what we're supposed to be part of. What are you doing? The book of Acts, it doesn't really end with closure. It ends just on purpose, kind of saying, all right, and keep this up. Until the day he comes back, keep this up. 
We're still in this. God is still wanting to bless every nation. He still has that same promise that he had for Abraham is still ringing true. So what are you doing? God wants a relationship with all of creation. How are you doing that? How are you part of that? How did you do it this past week? Sometimes it's easy in theory to be like, yeah, I'm part of that. Okay, how did, how did we do it this last week? When I think about this last week for me, I, I think I probably fell short. I don't know if I really moved God's plan forward a whole lot this week. I need to do better this next week. Who in your life does not have a relationship with God and they need it? That relationship that he wants, he's pursuing them. And what are you doing for that? The book of Acts is exciting. It paints this picture of all these things happening. Just this like explosion. It's, 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 a fire is the right visual for this. It's, I mean, it seriously just goes from one place to the next to the next, one city to the next city. And I, I think the disciples running around just saying, how the heck do we keep up with this? Now we have this another city over here. We just sent everybody over to this one because there's people over there. What are we supposed to do about that one? And now we get word there's another one further up north. And God just begins to move. And I can't help but think that some of that fire that was in the initial church is maybe just some weak embers nowadays. Now, this isn't meant to discourage us, honestly. Because the crazy thing about embers is, uh, I do this all the time, I forget to throw another piece of wood on the fire. It's down to embers. It's pretty easy to get that thing up in flames again. It's, it's pretty easy. Sometimes you just gotta pull the logs closer together get them working together a little bit better. Sometimes you need to throw some type of accelerant on it. And I hope that for us, that, that Sundays in some ways can be an accelerant for us, that we walk out of here and maybe you had a hard week, maybe someone was pouring some water on you and you're struggling and you walk in here, when you walk out, I, I pray that there was gasoline poured on you and you're just ready to go. You're roaring and you're like, let's do this. Part of why I said at the beginning of this, that announcement of like, hey, let's not, let's not forsake old habits is because I don't know, but right now I'm, just, I'm ready. I'm ready. I kind of hated the last six months and I'm ready. I'm ready for our city to be flipped upside down. I'm ready for people's lives to be changed. I'm ready for there to be hope where there hasn't been hope. I'm ready for families to come back together, for marriages to come back together. When you read through the book of Acts, you can't help but see this. That this is what we're supposed to be doing. I want us just to take a moment this morning and just say, God, speak to me. Speak to me right now. God can speak to you throughout the entire week. He can speak to you this afternoon. God can kind of do what he wants. But right now, let's at least set aside some time where we can say, God, I'm here. I'm listening. Speak to me. I'm going to block out everything else. I'm going to forget about what happened this last week. I'm going to forget about what's happening later this afternoon, what's going on this week. God, speak to me now. Speak to me now. I want to be a temple. I want people to encounter you when they come across my path. I want to kind of ask a question this morning. Maybe this isn't fair of me, but I don't care. I have the mic. <laughs> I want us this morning, and we don't do this often, but I want us to, uh, I want to kind of give a challenge. And I want to ask, okay, who's up for this? It's been a year since we started the campus here, and it has been a crazy year. But this isn't going to derail us. We have a city that desperately needs God. We have smaller cities all around us that desperately need God. They're filled with people that need God. And I want to ask this morning, how many people would say, I'm ready for this. I'm ready to be 
in flames again. I, I don't want to be an ember. I don't want to be a coal. I don't want to be a log off on my own, doing my own thing that's going to die out eventually. I want to be together. I want to be in this. I want to be part of this fire. I want to be a temple. I want that to describe me as I walk into my place of work, as I go home, as I'm around friends and neighbors and my family. I want people to encounter God. If that's you this morning, you're saying, I'm ready, let's do this. I, I want to see your hand. How many of you guys say, that's where I'm at? I want to do this. Yeah. That's the thing with fire. You can't do it on your own. I want to give an opportunity. Maybe you're in this room this morning and you, you feel like you've just never even been part of that fire. You're like, I, I've just been a piece of wood over here on my own. I, I didn't really even realize this was happening. Maybe this is completely new. Maybe you've been pulled away and it's been so long that you're just like, man, I don't, I don't even know if I can start up again. But if you're here this morning, you're saying, I, I want to try. I want that to be me. I, I want to step into this relationship with God. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to that. And I want us this morning, just everybody, to kind of pray this again. Because for me, even, as I'm, as I'm going into this, I, I want to have this attitude where this is like I'm, starting, like, I'm starting over. I'm at the beginning again. Let's do this. Do you remember that excitement, that joy in this salvation? I want to have that again. I need that. If that's you this morning or maybe this is kind of your, your first time or, or, or you're just really stepping back into it. You've been away for a long time and you're saying, I need to really give my life back to God. Not just like, hey, I'm, I'm kind of embers and yeah, I, I want to be better. But if you, if you want to do this for kind of the, the first time or something, I want to give you an opportunity right now. Would you just slip your hand up this morning? I want us to do this together. I want all of us to just say this. If you've done this before, I want it to bring you back to that moment when you first did that. Remember that joy. Remember that fire that was inside of you, that excitement. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for taking away all of my mistakes. I want to surrender my life completely to you. And help me to follow you the rest of my life. Amen. I want us to just, I want us to flip this town upside down. And I think that's, that's how God intended this. All right, and I, I just want us to leave here today just feeling like, all right, let's, let's do this. Let's do this. I'm ready. Get me out of here. I'm ready for Monday morning. I want to be back in work. I want to be around my coworkers again. I want to bring Jesus wherever I'm at. All right, and I, I, last thing is this. If you have an idea, if God places something on your heart of maybe something you feel is bigger than you, greater than you that you can't do on your own. That's why we're here together. That's why we're in this. That's the job of the church is to equip and to resource the saints. Once we see that in scripture. If you have a vision of reaching this city, give me a call. Come stop in, talk to me. I want to partner with you. Let's, let's do this. Let, let's make a difference. Let's make a difference, all right? All right, guys, with that this morning, I'm excited. I'm excited to wrap this whole thing up next week. Uh, but I, I'm just excited for, I think, how this city is going to change in the next year. All right. Thank you guys for being here today. You guys are dismissed.